scientists not only conceived nuclear weapons, they also took political leaders by the lapels, arguing that their nation, whichever it happened to be, had to have one first. Then they manufactured over 60,000 of them. During the Cold War, scientists in the United States, the Soviet Union, China, and other nations were willing to expose their own fellow citizens to radiation, in most cases without their knowledge, to prepare for nuclear war. Physicians in Tuskegee, Alabama, misled a group of veterans into thinking they were receiving medical treatment for their syphilis when they were the untreated controls. The atrocious cruelties of Nazi doctors are well known. Our technology has produced thalidomide, CFCs, Agent Orange, nerve gas, pollution of air and water, species extinctions, and industries so powerful they can ruin the climate of the planet. Roughly half the scientists on Earth work at least part-time for the military. While a few scientists are still perceived as outsiders, courageously criticizing the ills of society and providing early warnings of potential technological catastrophes, many are seen as compliant opportunists or as the willing source of corporate profits and weapons of mass destruction, never mind the long-term consequences. The technological perils that science serves up, its implicit challenge to received wisdom and its perceived difficulty are all reasons for some people to mistrust and avoid it. There's a reason people are nervous about science and technology. And so the image of the mad scientist haunts our world, down to the white-coated loonies of Saturday morning children's TV and the plethora of Faustian bargains in popular culture, from the eponymous Dr. Faustus himself to Dr. Frankenstein, Dr. Strangelove, and Jurassic Park. But we can't simply conclude that science puts too much power into the hands of morally feeble technologists or corrupt, power-crazed politicians and so decide to get rid of it. Advances in medicine and agriculture have saved vastly more lives than have been lost in all the wars in history. Advances in transportation, communication and entertainment have transformed and unified the world. In opinion poll after opinion poll, science is rated among the most admired and trusted occupations, despite the misgivings. The sword of science is double-edged. Its awesome power forces on all of us, including politicians, but of course especially on scientists, a new responsibility more attention to the long-term consequences of technology, a global and transgenerational perspective, an incentive to avoid easy appeals to nationalism and chauvinism. Mistakes are becoming too expensive. Do we care what's true? Does it matter? Where ignorance is bliss, it is folly to be wise, wrote the poet Thomas Gray. But is it? Edmund Way Teal, in his 1950 book, Circle of the Seasons, understood the dilemma better. It is morally as bad not to care whether a thing is true or not, so long as it makes you feel good, as it is not to care how you got your money, as long as you have got it. It's disheartening to discover government corruption and incompetence, for example. But is it better not to know about it? Whose interest does ignorance serve? If we humans bear, say, hereditary propensities toward the hatred of strangers, isn't self-knowledge the only antidote? If we long to believe that the stars rise and set for us, that we are the reason there is a universe, does science do us a disservice in deflating our conceits? In the genealogy of morals, Friedrich Nietzsche, as so many before and after, decries the unbroken progress in the self-belittling of man, brought about by the scientific revolution. Nietzsche mourns the loss of man's belief in his dignity, his uniqueness, his irreplaceability in the scheme of existence. For me, it is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. Which attitude is better geared for our long-term survival? Which gives us more leverage on our future? And if our naive self-confidence is a little undermined in the process, is that altogether such a loss? Is there not cause to welcome it as a maturing and character-building experience? To discover that the universe is some 8 to 15 billion and not 6 to 12,000 years old improves our appreciation of its sweep and grandeur. To entertain the notion that we are a particularly complex arrangement of atoms and not some breath of divinity, at the very least enhances our respect for atoms. To discover, as now seems probable, that our planet is one of billions of other worlds in the Milky Way galaxy, and that our galaxy is one of billions more, majestically expands the arena of what is possible. To find that our ancestors were also the ancestors of apes ties us to the rest of life and makes possible important, if occasionally rueful, reflections on human nature. Plainly, there is no way back. Like it or not, we are stuck with science. We had better make the best of it. When we finally come to terms with it and fully recognize its beauty and its power, we will find, in spiritual as well as in practical matters, that we have made a bargain strongly in our favor. 
but superstition and pseudoscience keep getting in the way, distracting all the Buckleys among us, providing easy answers, dodging sceptical scrutiny, casually pressing our awe buttons and cheapening the experience, making us routine and comfortable practitioners as well as victims of credulity. Yes, the world would be a more interesting place if there were UFOs lurking in the deep waters off Bermuda and eating ships and planes, or if dead people could take control of our hands and write us messages. It would be fascinating if adolescents were able to make telephone handsets rocket off their cradles just by thinking at them, or if our dreams could, more often than can be explained by chance and our knowledge of the world, accurately foretell the future. These are all instances of pseudoscience. They purport to use the methods and findings of science, while in fact they are faithless to its nature, often because they are based on insufficient evidence, or because they ignore clues that point the other way. They ripple with gullibility. With the uninformed cooperation, and often the cynical connivance, of newspapers, magazines, book publishers, radio, television, movie producers and the like, such ideas are easily and widely available. Far more difficult to come upon, as I was reminded by my encounter with Mr. Buckley, are the alternative, more challenging and even more dazzling findings of science. Pseudoscience is easier to contrive than science, because distracting confrontations with reality, where we cannot control the outcome of the comparison, are more readily avoided. The standards of argument, what passes for evidence, are much more relaxed. In part, for these same reasons, it is much easier to present pseudoscience to the general public than science. But this isn't enough to explain its popularity. Naturally, people try various belief systems on for size, to see if they help. And if we're desperate enough, we become all too willing to abandon what may be perceived as the heavy burden of skepticism. Pseudoscience speaks to powerful emotional needs that science often leaves unfulfilled. It caters to fantasies about personal powers we lack and long for, like those attributed to comic book superheroes today, and earlier to the gods. In some of its manifestations, it offers satisfaction of spiritual hungers, cures for disease, promises that death is not the end. It reassures us of our cosmic centrality and importance. It vouchsafes that we are hooked up with, tied to, the universe. Sometimes it's a kind of halfway house between old religion and new science, mistrusted by both. At the heart of some pseudoscience, and some religion also, new age and old, is the idea that wishing makes it so. How satisfying it would be, as in folklore and children's stories, to fulfill our heart's desire just by wishing. How seductive this notion is, especially when compared with the hard work and good luck usually required to achieve our hopes. The enchanted fish or the genie from the lamp will grant us three wishes, anything we want except more wishes. Who has not pondered, just to be on the safe side, just in case we ever come upon and accidentally rub an old squat brass oil lamp, what to ask for? I remember from childhood comic strips and books a top-hatted mustachioed magician who brandished an ebony walking stick. His name was Zatara. He could make anything happen, anything at all. How did he do it? Easy. He uttered his commands backwards. So if he wanted a million dollars, he would say, Sralad Noilim Ayem Evig. That's all there was to it. It was something like prayer, but much surer of results. I spent a lot of time at age eight experimenting in this vein, commanding stones to levitate. Ezir Enots. It never worked. I blamed my pronunciation. Most of the case histories I will relate in this book are American, because these are the cases I know best, not because pseudoscience and mysticism are more prominent in the United States than elsewhere. But the psychic spoonbender and extraterrestrial channeler Yuri Geller hails from Israel. As tensions rise between Algerian secularists and Muslim fundamentalists, more and more people are discreetly consulting the country's 10,000 soothsayers and clairvoyants, about half of whom operate with a license from the government. High French officials, including a former president of France, arranged for millions of dollars to be invested in a scam, the Elf Aquitaine scandal, to find new petroleum reserves from the air. In Germany, there is concern about carcinogenic earth rays, undetectable by science. They can be sensed only by experienced dowsers, brandishing forked sticks. Psychic surgery flourishes in the Philippines. Ghosts are something of a national obsession in Britain. Since World War II, Japan has spawned enormous numbers of new religions featuring the supernatural. An estimated 100,000 fortune tellers flourish in Japan. The clientele are mainly young women. Aum Shinrikyo, a sect thought to be involved in the release of the nerve gas sarin in the Tokyo subway system in March 1995, features levitation, faith healing and ESP among its main tenets. 
followers, at a high price, drank the Miracle Pond water from the bath of Asahara.